get started. Let's see. Sorry, yeah, I can push this. Um, cool. All right. So um, I'm going to be doing a talk about uh, some of the field work that my museum has been doing in the Judith River uh, since about 2015, actually. And uh, every year I give a field report. So this is kind of a compilation of. So hopefully you can hear me. Um, I have a lot of slides. I, I figured you'd want to see lots of fossils. So uh, we collect mostly dinosaurs, but we collect all sorts of other things as well. Um, so who are we? Well, we're Badlands Dinosaur Museum. We're based in Dickinson, North Dakota. We're not a very big museum, um, but I, I came in in 2016 and was asked to turn this into a world-class museum. And so I told them, uh, my employers, I said, well, um, the way we do that is we go out and we collect our own fossils. Um, we've got a few things that were in the historical collection, um, but since I got here in 2016, we've been pushing really hard to collect um, important new specimens. Uh, so this is kind of a picture of our old exhibit, which will hopefully be changing quite a lot in the coming years. Um, we don't have a huge staff. I have, there's three of us permanently. There's me, and then I've got um, Amanda in collections, and then Steve runs the lab. But every now and then we get um, we get volunteers or co contractors, and uh, in the summer we have an intern who runs our public programs. And also my wife is a paleontologist. She's an expert on duckbills. So in the top right corner you can see a picture of Liz uh, with a duckbill that she described uh, for one of these units back in 2000, let's say 2010, something like that. Uh, we also have a whole load of volunteers. We're slowly gathering volunteers or our volunteer corps in the in the lab, but also out in the field. Um, so in the field, we have 20 or so volunteers per summer. In the lab, we have sort of five to 12 at any given point. Um, we've been a federal repository since 2018. So uh, the fossils we collect are all from public land. And um, I've recently got 400 fossil storage cabinets, which are currently themselves in storage, but we're supposed to be getting a new storage building, which will make us one of the biggest repositories in our region. I currently have 40 fossil storage cabinets, but we should be going up to about 440 um, in about a year's time. So we're, we're going places. Um, here's a little view of our lab. Um, it's a fully featured lab. We have all, all kinds of uh, new tools. Um, back when I gave this talk a few years ago, um, and some people, some some of the uh, owners of Zoic um, were watching, they were really excited by some of the specimens that we were talking about, especially the ones in hard concretions. And so they got in touch with us and said, you know, um, we've got some new air chisels that you could use in your lab, really powerful ones for helping deal with these concretions. So our lab's been growing and getting some of this new equipment from Zoic. It's been really great. So I'm obviously British, so you know I have a connection over in England, and uh, I've been in touch with them a lot. They've been really great. We do a lot of 3D printing. These are a bunch of models that we printed for our education and outreach, so we do a lot of that. Um, but we also do things like reconstructing missing parts of the fossils that we've collected. So this is a Triceratops grill from the Hell Creek Formation um, in Montana. And you can see in the top left corner, um, it was the edge of the cliff was basically where the, the frill had broken off. So we 3D modeled the right hand side of the frill and then mirrored it in software and 3D printed the missing part of the frill. So we've been doing that increasingly with, with our fossils um, so we can complete them for exhibits and they look nice. Um, so this is part of the, uh, the 3D model making process. Sometimes we use something called photogrammetry, where we take lots of photographs and stick them all together to make a 3D model. Uh, and then we've been recently using laser light scanning uh, to make 3D models of uh, some of our tyrannosaurs and other, other fossils. <coughs> uh, we also have some beautiful feathered dinosaur models. Uh, I call them the best ones in North America, but they're made by a Serbian artist. He's absolutely astounding. And so these are some of the specimens that we've been finding. This is a new dinosaur I described in 2020 called Triarchuncus, which means Captain Hook, because uh, it has these crazy hook hands. And we had this beautiful model made by Boban from Serbia. And he won the uh, International Lanzendorf National Geographic Prize for this model uh, in 2018. So uh, we have some really nice new exhibits. 
uh, going on display. But I came to talk about field work. So uh, the rest of the slides will be all the field work and, and a lot of the stuff that we've been finding. So we do field work in the Hell Creek Formation just before the KT boundary when dinosaurs go extinct. So that's about 66 million years old. But everything I'm going to talk about today is from the Judith River Formation, um, which is about 78 to 76, 75 million years old. Um, and it's in Montana, northern Montana. So just the state west of us. Um, it takes us about five hours to drive there. So we, we drive out there and camp there. Uh, for about three months a year, depending on how much funding we have at that point. And uh, everything we collect is from public lands, um, especially these days. So here's a picture of what North America looked like during um, the late Cretaceous, the Campanian period, about 78 to 75 million years ago. Um, maybe you can see my mouse pointer. Here's Montana. And Montana was basically a narrow floodplain um, on on the edge of the Western Interior Seaway that, that cut the continent in half. And as we pass through time, there's a delta that builds out all the way across Montana, um, coincident with a little bit of sea level rise and fall as well. And it's the animals that live on that delta that we're finding the fossils of. Uh, part of what we're also doing is figuring out um, exactly the timing and the dates of the different parts of the Judith River in Montana, uh, usually by using either radiometric ash dates or looking at some of the microfossils and uh, some of the other fossils that we find. So our first site is Kennedy Cooley. That's where this red star is. Um, so it's on the westernmost part of the Judith River. The Judith River is in purple in this um, map. And here's a picture of Kennedy Cooley. Now this is the lowermost part of the Judith River formation. So there's a nice coal prominence at the bottom, and you can see above that there's a thick sandstone and then some mudstones above that. Most of, even though that map showed a lot of purple, most of that land is nice flat farmland, uh, typically for arable crops, although there are some parts where they have uh, cows, uh, beef cattle. So this is an actually, a, this is a wheat farm with some badlands in the bottom, and uh, that's where you can collect dinosaurs. So this is a little section showing uh, the rocks, um, the bottom coal zone you can see. Um, even though this is Judith River formation, it's only about um, a mile south of the Canadian border. And if you were up in Canada, you'd be using the words foremost formation and old man formation for these rocks. And that's actually much more useful for us because the Canadians have been uh, dividing these rocks up a lot over the last 20, 30 years and figuring out where the dinosaurs are in those formations. Um, and that there's much less information for Montana. Uh, so we use the Canadian terms for the most part. So the foremost formation is down at the bottom of the coulee where that coal is, and the upper part is what's called the lower part of the old man formation. So here we are down in that coal. Um, no one ever finds any dinosaurs in the coal, so you can just hang out there and uh, measure sections and you don't have to worry about it. So we were down there with this uh, university group and uh, I was saying, you know, you don't have to worry when you're down in the coal because you never find anything. But of course, we found something. So uh, these are some little bits of bones sticking out of that coal. Um, and they're quite cool because one of them was this. This is an armor uh, plate from an ankylosaur. And there were little bits of this coming out all along that coal, um, all ankylosaur bits. So that's really important because uh, in the foremost formation down in that coal, um, there are only two known dinosaur species, the Natotheristes, which is a large Displetosaur tyrannosaur carnivore, and then a weird horned dinosaur called Xenoceratops. No one's ever collected any, any other dinosaurs from those units, or at least not from diagnostic materials. So we went in there 2017, 2018, dug a big hole, and found lots more of this specimen. So these are the neck plates of um a large ankylosaur a nodosaur you see these big pits that we've got on almost all of these plates it's covered in these big pits these are called necrotizing dermatitis and they're where either a bacterial or fungal infection has got underneath the horny sheath that would have covered these plates and infected the bone surface and in fact um this is quite common on all of the armor plates that we found at this site 
Um, so we found lots and lots of armor plates. We also found most of the leg bones and a whole bunch of ribs and other bones. We didn't find many small bones. Most of them seem to have washed away, um, but we found um, most of the major limb bones. And we also found the skull. So this is the top of the skull um, with a little outline diagram on it. This is as it was found back in 2017. And this is it being cleaned up in the lab. So you can see the beak at this end. These are the attachment points for the lower jaw. There's even ear bones preserved. It's, it's quite well preserved. It's a bit crushed, a um, little bit distorted, but it's even got the teeth uh, beautifully preserved in the tooth sockets. Um, so this is what we have from that specimen. It's a nodosaur. So this is one of the armored dinosaurs that didn't have a tail club. It has a kind of rounded head and it has big spikes along the edge of the body, especially a double spike over the shoulder, uh, which we found both of. So we have most of the large bones from this individual. Um, and it's, it's important because um, the next youngest known nodosaur is actually from about 3 million years up from here. So this is probably an ancestor to um, something like Edmontonia or Panoplosaurus, which are the nodosaurs known from the dinosaur park formation. Um, so it's, un it's undoubtedly a new species and will tell us a bit about nodosaur evolution um, in North America. Um, also at that site, because it's a coal, we get a lot of um, amber. Um, so we collected bags, a little, a little bag of these amber pieces and I sent them up to a colleague in, um, in Canada who looks at amber and does all kinds of studies on it. And in the amber, he found some disgusting bugs. So only disgusting ones. We didn't get any nice beetles. We had a bunch of mites. We had a deflated maggot. That's a maggot in this uh, middle picture. And then also a horrible biting midge. So uh, pretty cool though to find those. So we added to the known uh, insect fauna of the foremost formation, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, also, a few tyrannosaur teeth came from that site, so this specimen was probably eaten by a tyrannosaur. And uh, also this, and this was quite a surprise because this isn't from an uh, ankylosaur, this is from a ceratopsian. It's not from Triceratops, I've shown a picture of Triceratops in the corner there, um, but it's actually from probably Xenoceratops. And it has these stripes across it. So you can see a couple in the middle. I was pointing with my finger then. That's not what I use. Um, you can see all these stripes that go across this frill piece. And what these are, are tooth marks. And this is a better specimen. This is a Triceratops from the Hell Creek Formation. Um, and one of the things I study is, is tooth marks of Tyrannosaurs on Ceratopsians. And we can model um, how a this tyrannosaur bites its uh, food by looking at which tooth marks cross over each other. So that's kind of what you're looking at here. Uh, and from that, you can see that, um, let's see, can I reduce this down? Yeah, can you move that? There we go. Um, we can see the order in which the bites were made um, because uh, the red one at the bottom was made first because it's crossed over by the other ones. So that, um, that piece of frill that we have from that uh, from the ankylosaur site has the same kinds of tooth marks all over it. So it will be added to the study that we're working on for how tyrannosaurs eat. So moving a little bit east of, of there, um, so here's that Kennedy Cooley where we were. We're now moving to Hava. It's pronounced Hava in uh, Montana. It's always a challenge when you're over here, like how people are gonna pronounce things because you know, it's obviously based on a French place, but they call it Havre. If I say lava or something, no one would know what I was talking about, but uh, uh, this is pronounced Havre. Uh, so we're a little bit uh, east, we're about 70 miles east of Kennedy Cooley. And it's also the Judith River, but we're moving up a little bit in section. So we're actually at the boundary between the Old Man and Dinosaur Park formation. The Dinosaur Park is kind of this upper part, and the, the Old Man formation is lower. It's all Judith River, but these are the terms we would use if we were in Canada, which is what's helpful. So one of the reasons we know we're at that boundary is because we've got some dinosaurs that tell us where we are in time. So this is a specimen that my wife Liz found in uh, 2019 called Liz Centro 2. It's kind of broken up in the ground, but we were very fortunate 
uh, we dug in and found more of this thing. Um, and here's the frill. So this is actually the best bit to find of a, sem of a um, horned dinosaur, usually, because the shape of the spikes around the frill is very, it evolves very quickly and it's very different between, between species. And what this specimen had, it had these forward pointing spikes that I've shown kind of in blue. And it had these uh, rounded spikes in yellow and inward pointing spikes on the top. And that tells us that this is Centrosaurus apertus. Now we also had um, a nose horn and other parts of the frill. And again, these, these evolve rapidly in horned dinosaurs. Um, we, we've done a bit of work on this since these photographs from a few years ago. So we've, we've actually um, reconstructed this a little bit better than this now. Um, so yeah, these, these features evolve rapidly in as little as 200,000 years. So if we compare this with Canada, in Canada, the lower part of the dinosaur park formation has Centrosaurus apertus in it. And then when you get to the middle to upper part of the dinosaur park, you get a different one with long spikes on the frill called Styracosaurus. So we've got Centrosaurus apertus, and what that means is we're correlated with what would be the lower part of the dinosaur park in uh, mid-central Alberta. So we, we know where we are in time. It's a little bit more complicated than that because um, as you move south, um, the age of the boundary between the old man and dinosaur park changes. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So, um, oh, that boundary, here's that dinosaur park just up here. And in fact, the bottom of the dinosaur park is a sand that cuts down just at this level. So we're right at the very top of the old man formation here, but we're in the Centrosaurus apertus zone, which tells us how the formational boundary changes age as we move south. So I included this slide because the next site is actually in the very bottom of the dinosaur park formation. So this sandstone you can see here that Jack is, is looking at, this is the very, very bottom sandstone of the dinosaur park. And we were looking through it and we saw lots of bits of bones sticking out. Um, and Jack found this in 2020. Um, so it looks very promising. Um, those bones sticking out over about, um, 40 meters of the sandstone, a, lo a long distance. And just around the corner from there in the same layer um, was this bone sticking out. And the whitish bit you can see in the bottom right, that is what we could see. And then Jack dug in a little bit more and revealed this brown bone. And then just here at the top, you can see teeth. This is a jaw. Um, and it looks like this. So this is, there's the white bit on the far right. Uh, it drops down a little bit at the front. So this is the beak, and this would be a lambiosaur. And in fact, when Jack was digging this out, he went round it, and just as he got into a little bit more of the cliff, um, he found the other jaw, and it had the beak attached. Uh, and that was bigger than our permit would allow us to dig that year. So we covered it up and got a permit and went back the next year and uncovered this. And this is, you, know, you probably can't quite tell what you're looking at, but that other jaw came from the bottom. And if I just, oops, um, this is um, part of the top of the skull and then the crest of the back of the skull. So we took this back to the lab, we flipped it over and we cleaned the other side and got this. So this is a skull of a Lambiosaurus. This is the only Lambiosaurus ever collected from the United States. And uh, we were a bit surprised at how nice it was on this side, actually. Um, the previous slide I showed you just had the crest because that's all we could see from that side. Um, usually when we collect these, we... Um, incidentally, I can't see if anybody has any questions or anything or if there's any text. Um, I'll just keep talking and we can, we can discuss all this stuff at the end, I guess. Um, yeah, so we could only see the crest. And in fact, the bones of the face and the lower jaw had moved away on the upper side of the skull. But when we flipped it over, uh, the right side, this side, um, it's all completely in place. So it's a beautiful skull. Um, and there's a partial skeleton. We've also got parts of the neck, the back, and the tail vertebrae, and the pelvis, some of which is all still together. So we, we nicknamed it Liberty the Lambiosaurus because it comes from the US. Um, and it's important because Lambiosaurus is only known from the middle to the upper part 
of the of the um, dinosaur park formation. So, other some of our colleagues in Canada have demonstrated that when you move this far south, the dinosaur park sort of um, it starts a little bit late this far south. So that's consistent with what we've just found this Lambiosaur. That Centrosaurus apertus zone is down here, which is consistent with where we found our Centrosaurus. So that's pretty cool. It helps us to to really lock uh, where we are in time um, for these units. So we've been digging at that site the last couple of years on, uh, on the Lambiosaur skull side uh, to get the rest of the skeleton out. And then this last year, uh, last year in 2023, one of our volunteers hands me this lump on the left that you can see. And she's like, what is this? What is this? And I'm like, well, what does the other side look like? Because it kind of looks like the impression of a turtle shell. And she said, well, it looks the same. And I'm like, well, where's the bone? Well, it's not bone. This is skin. Um, this is the skin of a lambiosaur. It's kind of warty. It looks a bit like a toad. Sometimes you see um, beautiful drawings of hadrosaurs, these duckbills with large, uh, we call them feature scales. Uh, but actually, you only get those on hadrosaurines, which are the ones that have smaller crests. These big crested forms had kind of warty skin. Um, and you can't really see it very well on this. This is the back of the body. So this is the back of the rib cage. And then this is the bottom of the femur and the rest of the leg goes down in this direction. A sinkhole has destroyed the pelvis and the top of the femur up here. But this orange that we can see is all skin and it goes all the way down the leg as well. So we've collected about half of the, um, half of the skeleton and we're getting the other half this, this coming year. And it looks like it's got skin along the back of the rib cage from the shoulder all the way down to the hip and then all the way down, at least as far as the middle of the, the, middle of the shin. And we're, we're expecting the foot to be on the end of this leg because it's got an articulated leg. So it's really quite amazing. It makes it really difficult to collect, um, but it looks like it could be the most extensive skin impressions known for a Lambiosaurus. Otherwise, they've just got a few patches from around the hip. They have better skin impressions for a closely related one called Corythosaurus. But um, yeah. Pretty, pretty cool, this site. Very excited by it. And there is the, the neck clicked onto the skull uh, just a little while ago. We actually, last night, we just went to the hospital here in Dickinson and we CAT scanned this skull so that we can uh, look at the shape and size of the resonance chamber inside the crest to see uh, how this may have made noise because it's so beautifully preserved in three dimensions. We're hoping to get that kind of data. So I haven't seen the CAT scans of this skull yet, but I'm told they came out really nice. Um, so we're very excited about that. Oh, and uh, it's also a nice piece of artwork we had done of this, uh, of Liberty, that we have put on our lactation pod that the hospital actually provided to the museum. So when we do a bit more publicity about this specimen, we'll be using these images a bit more. But uh, so here's a bit of a sneak preview of it. It's uh, suitably crass, I think. I said, I said put an American flag on its crest uh, because it's the only American one. Because uh, you can decide what colors you like on dinosaurs, right? So, uh, and uh, that's uh, how we had that one done. But that's only one side of that site. The other side, um, all those bones were coming out that I showed you pictures of before. So in 2022 and 23, we've been digging that side and we went really big last year and were helped out by this little rattlesnake you can see there on the shovel. Um, so we, we, we dug in there. What do we get? We get mostly large leg bones, low down. Um, these are mostly big duckbill bones. Um, here's some tooth marks made by a tyrannosaur on one of those large duckbill bones. Um, and so we make lots of big jackets removing those bones. And then just towards the end of our digging last year, we actually got a jaw, a maxilla, an upper jaw from another lambiosaur coming out among those leg bones. And we look, look back at it. And in fact, we don't have multiple individuals, we don't think, in that spot. We have like two right femurs, I think, two right tibiae. So it's possible that that other side of the site has another skeleton of a lambiosaur coming out. And we're hoping there'll be more skull bones this year to go with this maxilla. Maybe it's not as complete as the other skull, but um, great potential. We're super excited to get out there and make that hole even bigger uh, this year. Just above that site, we get lots of nice leaves. So um, 
as we cut down and do the overburden, we cut through this leaf layer. So we split all the blocks up. We've collected dozens of leaves um, that tell us about the flora um, that uh, lived at the time and obviously what uh, probably what this duckbill was eating as well. And then in amongst those sandstones, we get these pebble lags. Um, they look quite coarse, but these are actually um, what we call intraformational mud clasts. So they're just balls of mud. But in these little muddy pebble channels is where we get small bones. So we've got all kinds of small bones coming out at the same site. So we're working in these different levels and collecting different things. What else do we get in those lags? Well, we get things like this nice claw. This is a baby duckbill jaw from one of those lags. We have a couple of these. Uh, well, the other one's got teeth in it. So we have little baby dinosaurs coming out of the same spot. Um, this is a complete turtle skull that we got just last year. Uh, this is part of a crocodile brain case also from there. And there's a little tiny theropod claw. This is very small. You can, you can see the sand grains in the background and some of those mud clasts as well. So anytime we see this horizon, we're very, very carefully cutting through it because there's this, these really cool tiny fossils. In 2021, I think it was, um, I was working through this mud class layer and found these flaky bits of bone you can see down here. And if you know anything about um, dinosaur age vertebrate fossils, you might identify this as belonging to a pterosaur. And it is. This is these are little bits of pterosaur bone. Now, you find little bits of pterosaur bone every now and then. They're not common at all. They're very rare. But you never really get your hopes up because... Usually you just find a lump like this. It's not, it doesn't really lead to anything. But uh, the same year, a little bit later, we found more pterosaur bone. This is a little neck vertebra. Um, and it cleaned up really nice. Uh, Deanna's cleaned this one up in our lab. And so we've actually got multiple bones from a pterosaur coming out of the same site. This is that vertebra that was cleaned up from the top and from the side. And then we've also got um, a mixture of toe bones and uh, some small wing bones as well. Um, oh, here we go. Um, and we think it's from something called cryodracon. Cryodracon is actually a very large as a dark kid uh, pterosaur from uh, Canada, uh, also known for the dinosaur park formation. Um, they have a couple of bones from it, um, uh, very large bones. We have, um, I think, two or three neck vertebrae, and then those are the wing bones and toe bones that I showed you. Um, so what we have makes it either the second or third most complete pterosaur already from Montana. Um, and they only have this partial skeleton of cryodracon from Canada. Ours is much smaller than the one from Canada. So it's actually very interesting, apparently, because small pterosaurs, probably half-grown or one-third grown individuals, are very rare. So as we collect more of this specimen, it's going to tell us about how cryodracon grew. We, we also have this, which is possibly part of the skull of that pterosaur. It doesn't really obviously look like anything else, but I'm not an expert on pterosaurs, so I don't know quite what this is yet. But this kind of delicate material is, is what we collect in that uh, gravelly layer. We have another skeleton coming out of that gravelly layer, and this is one of the bones from it, shoulder blade, uh, collected in 2021. And here's a bunch more bones from that second skeleton. These are all scattered through that gravelly layer. Uh, this we actually think is part of the pubis. We have a number of neck vertebrae. Um, in the top left, there's a lovely dorsal vertebra. The frontal, this is part of the skull uh, here on the right, uh, center left, um, where my mouse pointer is hopefully moving. Uh, that's the orbit. So this is where the eye would be. And then we have a few little limb bones as well. And then last year we went back and we found even more. We have a metatarsal from the middle of the foot, um, another neck vertebra, and the coracoid that fits with a scapula. It's from the opposite side to the scap we have. So we know that both sides of the shoulder were present in this. So what is it? Well, this is what some people would call a little raptor. It's a truodontid raptor, um, either Stenonychosaurus or Latinovinatrix, um, also known for the dinosaur park formation in Canada. And it had very short arms, um, and it has long legs, 
and it has the raptor claw on the foot, but it's not quite as big as in the classic raptors, the dromaeosaurids. So very closely related to raptors and birds. Um, there's very few skeletons of truodontids from North America. You do get teeth and odd bones every now and then, but associated skeletons are rare. Um, I think there's two from Montana, there's a couple from Canada, and there's one from Utah. And the, the one from Utah is a foot, basically, or it's a leg. Um, so this is actually potentially really, well, it is very important. We have, it's potentially very, so exciting because we've got parts, all parts of the body. We've got the head, the neck, the middle of the back. We've actually got more of the pelvis. I've not colored in this diagram properly. Um, we've got the tip of the tail, the feet, and parts of the hands. So all parts of the body were present when this thing fell apart and got scattered through the bone bed. So every year we're collecting more of it. We hope to get some more of it this year. It's a super cool little raptor guy. So yeah, overall Jack's bone bed is a super sight. Uh, it's not, uh, but in the same area, we also prospect for new sites. Um, so this is, <laughs> I, every year I look at this rock and I think I'm not standing anywhere under that, but there's a whole bunch of uh, cliff swallows that build their nests under that ledge. Uh, it, it looks like it's going to fall down one day. Hasn't done yet though. Um, last year we found this um, blob. And when you see these rounded lumps like this, you think, is that the head of a femur or is it a pachycephalus or dome? And this one was a pachycephalus or dome. So this is one of these dome-headed dinosaurs that sometimes you see them drawn bashing heads and there's some new ideas about um, what they would have done with their dome-shaped heads. Um, this one was quite cool because the uh, rock that it was in left a natural impression of the, the endocast of the brain uh, on the underside which is quite cute. So this is a dome head called foraminocephaly also known from the middle dinosaur park formation. Um, on the left here uh, just these are just random things that we find on the surface when we're surface collecting. That's a cheek spike from a horned dinosaur. On the right is a, a toe bone of a duck bill, but these three stripes, there's actually four stripes that go across it, are tooth marks from a tyrannosaur that scraped its teeth really deep into that bone. Uh, the left here is part of the frill of a small ceratopsid. And then there's the lower jaw of another little ceratopsid, so these horned dinosaurs. And uh, speaking of horns, I'm, I'm really pleased with this one. A few years ago, we found this horn. And this is the horn from a really young Chasmosaurus. Um, so on the right here, you can see a, a more complete baby Chasmosaurus with just a little bump of a horn. And that's what we've got here on the left. We didn't find the one on the right. That's from Canada. But um, really cool to find these baby dinosaur bones. Um, we've also found something like 30 new microsites in this area. So these are sites where we find very tiny fossils that tell us about all the other animals that have lived uh, in this area. So um, we've got some frog bones and lizard bones, uh, various teeth. Uh, the top right is an armor plate from the arm of one of these really big basilemid uh, armored tortoises, turtles, um, that would have lived at the same time. So here's some duckbill teeth, um, part of a snapping turtle shell and a turtle pelvis and some tyrannosaur teeth and a raptor tooth from those microsites. Um, these are some backbones from a salamander. So we get uh, amphibians. We, we don't find them articulated and we don't find associated amphibians very often. But if you go in these microsites, you can find jaws and backbones from them. Uh, and a piece, little piece of amber as well. Um, these are some of my favorite things to find in microsites. These are called granules. So we often think of, of armored dinosaurs as having these great big spikes and plates all over their body, and they do. But in between the plates, they need a bit of flexibility. But they still have armor there. So these little dots that you can see in this articulated specimen in New York, those are granules. And they give, they're kind of like chain mail, I think of them. So anytime you find like a, it looks like bone, but it's made of little blobs. Um, those are skin granules of ankylosaurs. Uh, top left, there's a lizard jaw from one of our microsites, even with its little teeth intact. Part of a bird jaw, and then another piece of dinosaur bone with tooth marks on it. Oh, and every now and then we get eggshell from a dinosaur eggshell from these microsites as well. Um, we get a lot of tyrannosaur teeth. 
uh, people like tyrannosaur teeth, so I always put lots of pictures of them in my talks. So here's an example of some of the tyrannosaur teeth that we get, including beautifully preserved uh, serrations. We get a lot of tyrannosaur teeth at these sites, so everybody loves to find them, of course. So uh, they're quite special looking fossils, even if they don't tell us too much. Um, they're, they're always nice to find. Here, this, one, this one's a bit weird because it's completely hollowed out. So um, when it was resorbing its tooth, all the dentine inside must have been completely resorbed before the uh, enamel crown popped out uh, when it was replacing its teeth. Um, I include this photograph. This is just above Jack's bone bed, actually, where we park our trucks. But you probably can't see anything. But this is actually a teepee ring. This ring of rocks would have weighted down the edges of a, a teepee of the Native Americans that would camp there. So this is right on the edge of the cliff. Um, and obviously there's like a stream in the Badlands, a small river in the Badlands below. So a good water supply. So every now and then you see things like these uh, teepee rings. Uh, if, you, if you keep your eye on the rocks that are on the ground. Uh, here's another dig uh, from Hava. This is called Deanna's Baby. Uh, in 2022, when Deanna was out prospecting with us, she brought me a couple of these. And she said, what are these funny little vertebrae? And I was like, those are baby hatchling dinosaur vertebrae. Uh, go back to where you found them and see if you can find any more. And you usually don't. You, know, you might find one or two at a microsite, but you don't usually find anything else. But Deanna found another three or four of these. Um, and that was, that was quite exciting. And right next to them were these chunks of dinosaur eggshell, this black stuff. The eggshell is black in this, in this formation. Um, so we had chunks of eggshell and we had bones. Look at all these. These are little baby hatchling embryo bones. These were collected off the surface. They washed out from a horizon where we mixed in with this eggshell. So this was really exciting. Um, we couldn't find any eggs in place in the ground, but they must be there because we have eggshell all over the place and we have these, um, these uh, hatchling bones. Uh, this one in the top right is the top of a tibia, a shin bone, and these are duck bills. So, you know, these are animals that are 30, 40 feet long and they would have had a femur or, or, or one of these major limb bones would have been about three feet long. And you can see this fits just between my fingers. Um, this would have been about three inches long. Or four inches long so these are little tiny babies um so we went back there in 2023 steve took a little team down there uh, with deanna you can see her in the top left corner and took a look at this site trying to find um any eggs and steve found this quite quickly this is the cross section of an egg in the cliff so you can obviously see it's kind of curved and looks like half an egg and that's exactly what it is um, here's uh, possibly that same egg uh, extracted, but you can see the curved, more curved surface of the eggshell. And this is what I call a smushed egg. So this is actually, a, it's an egg that's been kind of squashed, so maybe it hatched. But what's interesting about the eggshell <clears throat> in, this, in this site is it might have part of the mem one of the membranes inside the egg preserved. Um, if I go back quickly to this eggshell picture, you can see the eggshell is black, but on the underside of the eggshell, it's got this kind of yellowish stuff. And we think that might be mineralized membrane from inside the egg. Um, I'm not saying it's gonna be beautifully preserved with biomolecules or anything like that, <clears throat> but um, maybe it's a mineralized membrane. Um, and also coming out of that site, uh, we've got some of these burrows. So this is probably a stable land surface. Some animals are burrowing in, like little mammals, and maybe lizards, things like that. Uh, and then on the surface, um, dinosaurs are nesting. So we had um, a number of eggs recovered from that site. We'll be digging there again um, in three months time, something like that. So I'm gonna move along a little bit now, go to my last area of the Judith. So we were just, looking in Hava, in the center of this map, which isn't on this one. And we're going to go now to Glasgow on the far right, an area near Glasgow, near the village called Hinsdale. So um, we're moving about another 150 miles east. So this is way, way out on the delta, um, where dinosaurs were in stomping around. So 
we don't really know the age of the rocks that far east. We don't know quite which bit they fit into because the rocks are a little bit different from the ones far west. So we've been looking for ammonites in the overlying and underlying marine shales to see if we can date the rocks that are above and below us. And we've had a little bit of success with that. Um, and every now and then we come across uh, marine reptile remains in those rocks as well. But mostly we're in the Judith River. Um, so here we are at one of our sites we found in 2018, I think. Can't quite tell because it's got a border at the top of my screen. Um, we didn't get all that much of this duck bill, but it's actually really cool. We just had some sections of the tail. There was actually a lot more of it there. There's leg bones and various other bones, but they were long since destroyed by weathering. They're not very well preserved. But this section of tail is very well preserved. And one of the reasons why we collected it is because it has a horrible injury. Um, at some point in the life of this duck bill, something hit its tail from above. It split the bone into two. The spine of the vertebra was split in two and shoved down either side of the rest of the spine. And then it healed, if you want to call it that, and left this horrible sort of split lump uh, at the top of the spine. And in fact, all of the spines that we collected from that section of tail have this warping consistent with an impact injury from above. Um, it's actually the second specimen we have like that. These kinds of injuries are seen uh, quite commonly in the tails of these duckbills. And we think these are mating injuries. Um, we have um, some research going on right now um, describing a number of these specimens, suggesting that this is perhaps where a male crushed the, the spines in the tail of a female. Uh, not a pleasant thought, but uh, that's nature for you. Um, here's another duckbill bone uh, from... Uh, that same area from the Hinsdale area. This is the first thing we found when we got to that area. We got out of the trucks and we walked over to this cliff and Jack looks down and says, there's a duckbill arm. And so we cleaned this up and it's a complete little duckbill arm sat there in a block of sandstone. And what's extra cool about this one is that it has skin preserved as well. It's got the mitten uh, around the, the hand and um, the, the free finger, most of it's contained within a mitten, the middle toes, but this little pinky finger that sticks down, you can see the skin that surrounded the finger really nice. So um, we have more skin at that site. We didn't have anything else from this specimen. Um, let's have a quick drink. Um, it was an arm that got ripped off. We, we actually have, actually, we do have the shoulder blade, a part of the humerus that fits onto the left side, but this was an arm that was torn off a carcass and floated along the river by itself apparently um, which is kind of weird but there you are um, one of the major bone beds that we have in that Hinsdale area is called the Bighorn Bone Bed and it's called that because I found this lovely horn there in 2017 and I work on horn dinosaurs so I was super excited because there were loads of other bones sticking out and I thought yes we've got a horn dinosaur bone bed here it comes this is what we've been looking for um, really important because there are not many horned dinosaurs known from the Judith River Formation. So this could be a really important site. Um, we went there in 2019 and really started digging in. And Liz, there's, she's looking really pleased because all those bones turned out to be duckbill bones. So this is a fantastic mass mortality horizon of uh, many, many duckbills. Uh, we have another one that has dozens, hundreds of dead duck bills in it, uh, just about a mile away. But this one's got maybe about a dozen so far. Um, so we get lots of leg bones and things like that. Uh, I think we've got like 80 bones in 2019. There's a nice claw in the bottom right corner. Um, another 300 odd, 400 bones in years since. Um, this is the sort of stuff that we get. We get lots of limb bones, lots of tail vertebrae, uh, quite a lot of skull bones and ribs. We don't get so many um, back vertebrae or neck vertebrae, not too many toe bones either, um, but we get the good bits, um, skull bones especially. So here's, uh, here's a couple of crew members dragging some of those jackets up the cliff. Uh, you can see some of those large limb bones in the top right. Um, what's quite what's quite cool about this one is you can see a full sized fibula on the my, my hopefully my cursor is showing on the right side and the far left is a sort of two thirds half grown tibia uh, fibula. Here's some of those skull bones. There's an upper jawbone with some teeth in it. 
Um, on the left side, there's a lower jawbone uh, where the teeth have fallen out. Uh, here's a, a post orbital with an eye socket. Um, these are frontals. Now they look a bit like brown splodges. Uh, most of the bones do. Um, but these are really important because this is where the crest attaches to the skull. And if you can see what shape the crest is in these guys, you can, you can see what species you have. Now these are three frontals. Uh, there's two right frontals and a left frontal, um, but the left frontal is smaller. So we know we have at least three individuals here. And from the shape of the frontals, we know that these are from Brachylophosaurus. There are at least four individuals preserved. We actually have about five, we think now, at this site. Um, so a mass mortality horizon of Brachylophosaurus. We get almost exclusively Brachylophosaurus at this site. Um, not totally exclusively. We've got some little raptor toe bones. There's a dromaeosaur raptor claw. Um, and we get lots of teeth of tyrannosaurs. Um, lots of tyrannosaur teeth at this site. Um, I love this jacket. It kind of sums up the site to me. There's a hip bone, a tail bone of uh, Brachylophosaurus and a great big tyrannosaur tooth wedged in with them. We have a lot of tyrannosaur teeth from this site. We have like a hundred of them, I think. And um, it suggests that there was this pile of dead duck bills um, that washed up together, possibly, but this is a mudstone, so they probably died there for some reason, maybe the edge of a pond or something. And then there was a feast for the local tyrannosaurs for months. They probably all came and, and ate from these carcasses. So we have a lot of shed teeth, um, which also may explain why we don't get so many of the middle of the back, because those parts tend to get destroyed by scavengers. Speaking of tyrannosaurs, I'm going to uh, end up the talk by talking about some of the tyrannosaurs we've been collecting. So um, in that area, we found a number of tyrannosaurs, four of them. I'm going to tell you about the, the first three. Uh, so tyrannosaur one is Denver's tyrannosaur. Back in 2017, I was collecting at a microsite and I looked up and I could see in the distance some foot bones, some metatarsals. And I thought, eh, I'll get to those in a minute. So I spent another half an hour or so collecting micro fossils. And I eventually went over there and I looked down. And we've been finding a lot of duckbill bones, so I wasn't thinking too much. Um, thought, yep, yeah, here's some more articulated uh, bones. And then I saw this, this pointy claw. And I was like, all oh, right, yeah, those are tyrannosaur foot bones. And not just tyrannosaur foot bones, but in this picture, you can see the claw, part of the metatarsals, but there's metatarsals here in the cliff. And they're articulated with the ankle. And in fact, there's two sets of them. Uh, it's not very obvious in this picture, but trust me, there are. So there's both feet articulated in the same spot. Now, you can get an isolated arm or a leg, just like uh, I showed you that one before that had skin. And that's not, that's not that rare. Uh, but to find both feet together, well, that suggests the legs are together. And if they're together, that means they're probably together at the hip. And if you've got the hip, well, why not the whole skeleton? So this was a really exciting spot. So we, we collected everything off the surface. Um, oh, so obviously we're hoping for something like this. You know, you've got articulated feet at the bottom and then they go up to the hips and then maybe the whole rest of the skeleton is there, uh, if we're lucky. This one's from Canada. So first thing we did is um, they were coming out next to a little stream. So we dug through the little stream bed and we found more of the toe bones. So if we're going to dig in, you know, we're going to dump a bunch of rock um, around the site. So we want to make sure that there's nothing there on the ground. So we checked the stream bed, got a bunch of nice toe bones. And then we had to remove 10 feet of overburden. So this is that little stream you can see where the shovels are. And then behind is what we needed to remove. So we dug down about 10 feet, got rid of all that rock, took us uh, five days, I think it wasn't too bad. And um, started carefully excavating into that rock. So here you can see, on the right hand side, you can see this is actually part of the foot. These are a couple of those metatarsals and there's a fibula next to them. So this is what the site looked like. Very quickly, it became immediately obvious that we had some bones in soft rock around this right-hand side, and then the great big concretion in the middle, which had some bones coming out of it. So here's some of those bones that were in the soft rock. Top left, you can see a beautifully preserved wishbone. Top right, there's part of that foot, a little bit disarticulated. 
And then here's the middle third of the tail, at the bottom, was in the soft rock. And here is um, a whole bunch of the belly ribs and this shoulder blade. <coughs> I've been talking a lot. Um, in that soft rock. So this is what the site looked like from above. I'll highlight the bones there. This right hand side, you can see part of the foot. This was the edge of the old cliff that we removed. <coughs> and this is what we think is going on in there. So there's a tail that emerges from that concretion, then goes back in again. And then all around this edge, we've got loads of belly ribs, a shoulder blade and a wishbone. And then the, the feet were at the bottom. So in that huge concretion, we think there's a whole skeleton, hopefully all articulated with a skull, but we don't actually know that yet. That brown stuff is hypothetical. So first step was taking out those visible bones. So the, all these belly ribs you can see here and a couple of other bones, we extracted those in jackets. And then we used a rock saw to cut the top parts off that concretion to make it a bit thin so we could um see we cross made crisscross shapes and then chiseled away some of that hard concretion um, we didn't go down too far because we didn't want to get to the bone layer we could see bones sticking out of the side so we just took about i don't know probably three thousand pounds worth of rock off the top of it to make it lighter and then we undercut underneath leaving the concretion um ready to lift by a helicopter so we built this metal lifting frame um, and chained it underneath that big slab and then in 2021 we got a chinook helicopter we had a couple of grants to pay for this and uh helicoptered out uh, what turned out to be 10,600 pounds of uh, rock and, st and uh, steel um a typical helicopter will do up to about 5,000 pounds well i say typical a huey if you go 10,000 and above, you need, well, if you go 8,000 and above, you need um, a big heavy lifting helicopter like this. So fortunately, there's a helicopter company nearby that does a lot of firefighting. So uh, we were able to get one of their helicopters. Uh, so that was a pretty incredible day. It all went fine. And uh, then we brought it back to Dickinson, flipped it over and wheeled it into our lab. And so there it is. Um, one thing that's quite cool is on the underside of this block, there's all of these clams. Uh, the, the impressions of clams. So this tyrannosaur would have floated along in the river and been washed into like a, a pond that was full of clams. Um, so we, we actually, um, we've removed all the impressions of these clams. We didn't destroy them, we, we removed them uh, so they can be studied. And we made a 3D model. So here's a few of those bones from the soft stuff that we've cleaned up in the lab. So there's that middle part of the tail, whole bunch of those belly ribs. We have 40 of these, which is basically all of them. There's one of the nice foot claws, and there's the shoulder blade with the wishbone as it would have been in life. And this is a picture of more or less where we are right now. We've done a little bit more cleaning than that. So this is the slab seen from above. Um, and you can see um, here's a hip bone. It's a little bit disarticulated. So what happened to this thing was that it died. It, it was washed in a river and then it got washed into like a, an oxbow or something that was full of clams and then it got rapidly well and then it probably filled with gas as it was rotting and its belly burst and it scattered its belly ribs and it scattered the other ribs and it flipped an ilium over um, but the vertebrae seem to have stayed intact and hopefully there'll be a head in the middle and the feet are in the right place as well so we think the middle of it sort of got moved around a bit when it burst basically so this is the tip of the tail that went in the block the rest of the tail curves around the top and you can't really see very easily here but the neck is actually here under the tail um, some of these long thin bits of bone are actually the neck ribs so the neck plunges down under these ribs and hopefully the head should be somewhere in the middle of this block um, but it's very very hard rock and it's taken us a couple of years to get to this point. So we reckon another couple of years probably we'll be done with it. Um, but we're making really good progress on that. This is what we use those Zoic tools for. Um, nothing else really cuts through this super hard concretion. Tyrannosaur number three, number two is a partial specimen I'm not gonna talk about, but number three is called Sisyphus. Um, this is turned into the holotype of Despletosaurus wilsoni. Um, so yeah, uh, Jack's B2 Tyrannosaur is what we called it when we found it. So 
Back in 2017, um, we found a premaxilla of a tyrannosaur, and this is a vertebral spine that had fallen out of the cliff. Um, the site looked like this. Um, this little rock is where we got that premaxilla out, but it's basically a sheer cliff. And we, we went back to this site in 2020. We, we first found all these things in 2017, but we can only dig them out one at a time. So first of all, we did the one in the big block, Denver's Terreno. And then in 2020, we went back to this site and uh, we were going to start here. And we saw this little tooth sticking out of the cliff. So Jack got up and dug around that little tooth. And there it is, the tooth sticking out of the bone. And it's this. It's actually the other premaxilla. So it's, uh, the two, it's the tooth bearing bone from the tip of the snout of our, our, our third tyrannosaur. Um, nearby, I saw some bone weathering out of a slab. And so I dug around it. It was all really weathered and nasty on that side. So I dug around it. I made sure it was full of glue, flipped it out. And this is what I saw. It was like, that is the lacrimal horn from a tyrannosaur. We already knew this was a tyrannosaur, but the lacrimal horn is one of the most diagnostic pieces. And we instantly knew we had Despletosaurus because it has this inflated little horn in front of the eye. So in 2020 and 2021, we did a lot of excavating at this site. This hole is about 25 feet deep, maybe more than that. Um, and it's quite extensive, the area that we've dug out. This is a, these photographs are actually the second year of digging. We've already taken a whole bunch of bones out from the area where, those, um, uh, where the shovels and stuff are. So, uh, big hole. What did we get? Well, we got more of the skull and uh, some other bones, like here's part of the hip. I'll show you some cleaned up pictures in a minute. Um, but this is what the hips look like. And uh, some parts of the neck as well and, and ribs and things. So uh, when we were digging in the bone layer, I, one of my uh, co-diggers, Josh, he started sort of giggling to himself. And uh, this is why, because he'd found the lower jaw and it's just super pretty. He was slowly uncovering all these teeth and uh, we, we, we didn't un undercut them. We just wanted to see the extent and uh, absolutely beautiful. This is kind of like the dream when you find one of these and uh, just incredible preservation. Uh, and then right next to that, where I was digging, I came across the upper jaw, the maxilla. So I was doing my own giggling at this point, but uh, just incredible, uh, just slow. This was in really soft sand. So most of the time, this site was really soft sand. Sometimes it was concreted, um, but most of this was just putting a little bit of water on and brushing away the soft sand. Um, so this is what that maxilla looked like back in the lab, the upper jaw. Uh, and amazing preservation because it's so easy to clean as well. You can see all the branching um, nerve and blood vessel, blood vessels on the surface of the maxilla. Just incredible. Um, so this is what we had of the skull. We actually had most of the important parts of the skull. We've got that postorbital and lacrimal that tells us the species. Um, we've got the full length basically of the sides of the skull we don't have any brain case and we don't have anything from the back of the lower jaw but we basically have a really decent skull um, and the shape of those um, bones especially around the eye uh, and parts of the back of the skull allowed us to name this as a new taxon called Despletosaurus wilsoni and it's actually from about half million years uh, um, younger than the nearest relative, Despletosaurus terosus, which is known from Canada. So, um, really cool specimen. Uh, here's some more of the post crania. So, there's the sacrum. So, those are the fused vertebrae from the hip region. Uh, here's a couple of those neck vertebrae. Um, oh, so this, this shows you the evolution of Despletosaurus. So, um, the one that we described is a transitional species. So down low, we have um, about 77 million years ago, we get Despletosaurus terosus. And then um, out in Hinsdale area, this new one we described, Despletosaurus wilsoni. Uh, we also get, we think we get wilsoni also in the Dinosaur Park formation. It's very similar to remains from the Dinosaur Park of Canada. And then high up, 
this red star about 75 and a half million years ago, you get Disputosaurus horneri. This is in the, the two medicine formation of Western Montana. So we see very subtle changes in the ornamentation around the eye and a few of the other bones, suggesting that we're seeing um, gradual, well, not gradual evolution, but um, linear evolution of a population over time. And these little horns and things of a display. So it's not too surprising that they're evolving quite quickly. So that's what we have of Jack's B2. Not too much um, of the post crania, but we just happen to have got the really diagnostic parts of the skull. So a uh, really cool specimen. And uh, we had this, uh, this 3D sculpt of uh, reconstruction uh, done. Uh, if anybody wants to buy one, we do sell them on the site, on the website. And then this is a first preview, the first people to see this. This is the skull reconstruction that we're having done. So we 3D scanned all the skull bones of this thing. And then any skull bones we don't have were um, modeled by a, a sculptor in Belgium. So we're just almost at the point where we're, where we're gonna print this out life size and have it on exhibit. And we'll also sell little versions of it in the shop. So uh, you're the first person to see that reconstruction. Uh, really, really cool. Um, I think this is my last site I'm going to talk about because I've probably been talking for ages. Um, Jack's Tyranno, the fourth Tyrannosaur. Also in 2017, we came across scattered bits of Tyrannosaur. I know you're all familiar with premaxillae now, so you recognize that instantly as part of the left premaxilla of a Tyrannosaur. Um, it was a whole bunch of shattered bone on the surface. Doesn't look very promising at all. But uh, I, I know now that this is the jugal here on the left. Um, but many of these fragments went together back in the lab. So I managed to get this together and this is the lacrimal. This is that horn over the eye again, the diagnostic bone. So that tells us this is the Um So in 2022 and 2023, we've been back to this site and dug a big hole, or rather Steve has been back to the site and dug a big hole. Um, in 2022, we found a post orbital, the other bone from around the eye, the best ones to find. Um, so we can tell what species we have. And there's a number of other bones there. They're a bit broken up, so they don't, they don't always look all that complete, um, but they're very, very, very nicely preserved. Look at these fine little spikes on this bone. This is actually the top of the nose, the top of the nasals, um, which is one of the bones that we were missing from the previous one, B2. Um, so this is what we have of um, Holger. So this is, we call this one Holger. Uh, well, those were some Danish uh, people came out and dug with us and, and uh, Steve and his crew decided to call this Holger after a mythical Danish hero. So we actually, again, have good parts of the skull. We have parts of both of the upper jaws. We have parts of both premaxillae at the front of the snout. We have the nasals across the nose. We have the, eye, the bones from around the eye. And we actually have a little bit more of the cheekbone than is shown on this. Um, and we're very hopeful we'll get more. Um, this this year, in just a few months time, we're gonna be back there and hoping to find more of this skull. So this one's from ever so slightly higher in section. It's from about 10 meters higher than um, B2 Sisyphus uh, that we named as just Petersaurus Wilsoni. So it's possibly related to Wilsoni, but it might be something ever so slightly different because it's probably from, let's say one or 200,000 years younger than that. So that, that's the last of the fossils that I have. Um, I also, I just like to end these talks with pictures of some of the wildlife that we see. So this is a little nest that somebody probably almost stepped on. Uh, some of the ground nesting birds that we get around there, you have to keep an eye open. Uh, we get all sorts of cool animals. We get prairie toads. There's a, there were some owls that nest near camp. And the, that's an owl chick, probably a great horned owl. Uh, and they just sort of... Uh, they watch you when you go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, uh, big salamanders, rabbits, um, tons of rattlesnakes. Um, last year we had hundreds and hundreds of toads. It was a real year for toads. It was a plague of grasshoppers as well, so the toads would help eat them. And uh, we had great fun with these little guys every night. They'd come and hop around camp, hundreds of them. And uh, just so many really cool animals. It's one of the nice things about being out there. And we see all these things. Uh, plus rattlesnakes, which we are also always very respectful of. Steve actually has a whole bunch of snakes at home, so he's a resident snake handler. And uh, evermore. The top left is a little mouse nest. Um, 
they're actually a little little uh, seeds that a mouse would eat from our top. Anyway, yeah, so um, we take volunteers in the field. If uh, anybody wants to dig, uh, we're full up for this year, but if you're interested in digging next year, um, you'd be welcome to volunteer. If you go to our website, you can find details of that. And uh, if anyone feels like donating to Dickinson Museum Center, um, you can donate via our website, dickinsonmuseumcenter.com. And otherwise, just uh, lots of people to thank all of our field crews from that many years. This is like seven years worth digging. And the land agencies whose land that we dig on, the Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Reclamation. And uh, at that point, I'm going to click stop share. And if anybody has any questions or anything, if I haven't talked for too long, I don't know how long I was talking for. Um, yeah, great. I hope, I hope you saw some cool stuff. Thank yeah. you very much for that, um, Dan, but that was absolutely fascinating. There are a few questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see them. If not, I'll go through them. Um, let me see what we've got here. Um, nope, well, I suppose it's in its order. You, you mentioned permits. It's obviously, is it quite strictly controlled? Or do you have quite strict controls over what you can do or what you can remove in any particular season? Um, yes. So we usually, we, we, we have what's called a surface collecting permit. So you have to apply for that and you have to be a, um, a repository to be able to collect or you have to have one associated with you. So we get the surface collecting permit. You can dig one square meter with that. You can collect off the surface, but you, you can only dig one square meter. If you're going to disturb any larger bit of ground, you have to take lots of photographs and document it all properly and then apply for an excavation permit. Sometimes they can, um, sometimes they can come through in a few months, but usually we have our year planned out. So we usually find a site one year and then dig it the following year. Okay. Uh, did you ever run foul of any kind of like um, Native American or First Nation uh, archaeological remains? Do you ever come across them, or they do they complicate your 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 work in any way? They don't tend to, because most of the Native American um, sites are not down in the Badlands. There is some stuff in the Badlands. Um, but you know the badlands erode quite quite quickly. So, um, you know, a few hundred years or a hundred years or so, and you, basically you, you're not got any like, any burial grounds or anything like that. There, they do exist up on the tops. So up on the sort of flat um, cropland and stuff like that, especially around the edges. Yes, you know where I had those teepee rings and things. Um, I don't have a very good eye for spotting arrowheads and things. Some other people do, but I generally don't because I tend to block out the chert. You know, it's like we're looking for bone, not chert, so I block those out. Um, and the Native Americans would visit um, these areas because most of the um, the harder rocks tend to be actually brought in by glaciers. So these wash areas, you get exposures of some of these. The very uppermost layer is like glacial rocks, um, gravels and granites and some cherts and things like that so they if they were going to look for um cherts to make uh, tools out of they could find them in the upper layers but down where we work a bit lower down we don't we don't get that kind of material but it is always a concern of the, our, our permit um agencies that we don't disturb anything um i've notified them a couple of times of occasional things we come across um but we generally don't because we're in we're down in the rocky areas. Okay, um, I can see you're going to have a sip. I'll let you have a, a sip, then because you, you you have entertained us very well. Uh, a couple of questions on skin. Um, how do you collect and preserve the, the, the skin? How does that is you know is it particularly difficult to remove from the sediment sort of the rocks? Yeah, so I mean, you know, we remove everything in jackets. And even though in the TV shows, you know, you see that the whole skeleton exposed, and there's a, we, we generally don't do that. We try not to expose too much. So there's a lot of skin at that um, Lambiosaur site, but we haven't exposed much of it. You used to put glue on it to preserve the skin. And that will preserve it, yes, but one of the new bits of research that's being done is looking for biomolecules or looking at um, 
other aspects of the preservation at the, at the molecular level or at the atomic level. Um, so if you add glue, you can uh, introduce um, contamination to some of those sort of biomolecular data. So we have this kind of balance that we've got to dig around it. So we look for where the orangey cross section is of that skin. And once we hit it, we sort of step back and we work around it. And so we can then jack it over the top and then flip the jacket over and open it in the lab and work down to the skin layer. And so I, this, it, it, is, it is a very good question because it's something that we're basically dealing with right now is how do we prepare it? Do we want to see the skin or do we just basically leave it in the rock for later study? It's like, well, there's a limit to how much you can know. So we're sort of keeping patches um, clean and available with no preservatives or anything on them. We haven't actually started preparing the skin from that site yet. Um, and we're very fortunate that Bismarck, just 100 miles up the road, they've got this wonderful uh, duck bill um, with skin that they've been preparing for a few years, Dakota. So they have expertise in how to prepare it and conserve it and stuff. And we actually know a bunch of people who work on biomolecule uh, fossilization. So we're in, we're in contact with them just to do it all in the right order. Because one person might want to see the shape of the skin and all the little scales. So they actually want the 3D preservation. Another person wants the chemical preservation. Um, we've got U ultraviolet flashlights that we can use that help us to see the details better. Um, yeah, it's complicated. And, and that's right on the edge of, of kind of preparation technology and um, the research that's going into preservation of skin. One of the reasons why we're finding more skin now than in the past, we used to think it was really rare. Um, and that's because most of the fossil skin that we have preserved is actually on the underside of the skeleton, the underside of the carcass, including these sites that we've got. When you, whenever you find a dead animal in a field, like the bones that are exposed to the sun and to bugs and things um, are usually showing because the skin has all been eaten away on the upper surface. But if you kick that dead rabbit over, you'll often find a crust of skin on the underside. And it's kind of the same um, with the dinosaurs that we get, that the underside um, is often very well preserved. And people were simply um, digging down and not really seeing the skin on the underside, uh, either preparation in the lab or not. I mean, obviously there are a number of mummies that have been found, but they're actually more common than we realized because it's all on the underside. And sometimes it can be quite cryptic too. So... We're excited. Um, I don't know quite what it's going to look like. I don't think it's going to be a beautiful, like, looks like a dried out carcass, although we are hopeful the leg might look like that. Um, but it is a new challenge for our, for our prep team, certainly. I suppose it's another one of these things where you'll, that, that you're aware if you get your eye in for these things as well. Absolutely. And you, and you, and you get to, as you say, you start to, you'll probably start to have an image of the animal as you're excavating it and you'll start to think, well, it's towards the bottom. This is where I'm going to find the skin, if there is any, and you're, you're already switched on for it. Um, obviously, some of, your, some of your slides have obviously got colours, and I don't really know the answer to this, but I suppose a lot of it is, is it guesswork, or is there anything that points to colours? I know you've made the wee joke about the one with the stars and stripes on its, uh, on its head. Um, I mean, from the biomarkers or from current reptiles or current environments, are there indications as to the possible colouring of the dinosaurs? Um, I mean, there has been research done on like physical colour. So some of the feathers and things have some of those biomolecules that allow you to see that physical colour. And sometimes you can see if not the colour, I'm not saying that we've seen this in the dinosaurs, but sometimes you know you might have stripes, so you might be just lucky and see sort of darker bits and lighter bits. Even if you don't know what colour stripes they were, you might see some kind of banding. We've seen that on some turtles, for example. Um, we don't have any indication of colour insofar as we know on this skin and stuff that we found so far. However, 
um, the arm that we had that had skin on it, that does have glue over the surface of most of the skin because of when it was prepared. But this new specimen is basically untouched. So if there's any possibility that we can get that kind of information from the iron or the minerals or any biomolecules, um, then it's there. And it's sort of, once we start those, opening those jackets and taking a look, we can get in touch with the right people and see if they can get any of that kind of information. But in terms of the color, I, I, I tend, we, we don't know what color they were. I think that um, I tend to approach it and say, well, where they've got the display organs on the skull um, is where I expect to see the color. And if I'm, I do my work on horned dinosaurs and the parts of the skull that are evolving most rapidly, presumably are the parts that they show off to each other enough. So the edge of the frill, we often see um, ceratopsians portrayed with like eye spots in the middle of the frill, but it's the edge of the frill, which is changing rapidly, not really the middle. So I think the edge of the frill would have been bright and very showy. Um, so I, I, I usually leave our artists to basically make their own, uh, put their own sort of footprint on a, on a picture because they're the artists. As long as it's scientifically accurate, they can choose the colors. So I didn't choose those colors other than the flag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we wanted to appeal a little bit, be a bit cheeky with it. So uh, yeah, generally I leave the artist to choose the colors. Yeah, uh, obviously to the audience, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I'll just work my way through. Um, from one of, one of the, the, the audience, from, for the Tyrannosaur, do you have any thoughts on why only part of it is formed in air concretion and the rest of it is preserved in the softer rock? Or has that been post-depositional chemical changes or whatever? Um, the concretions are present across um, those sandstones that it's preserved in. So, but yeah, why? Like, you know, we you know concretions are like they're, they're often patchy, but they also often form around um, fossils and they form around um, skeletons with perhaps flesh. The, the decomposition of sort of that fleshy material or soft anatomy may create chemical microclimates within the, um, within the matrix that cause the formation of um, concretions. Um, that might be the case here. Although this is a calcium carbonate cemented sandstone, super hard, but it's calcium carbonate, so you can acid prep it if you feel so inclined. And we, if we found a skull or if we found something really delicate in there, we may well acid prep it because it fizzes like crazy with acid. Um, but there are concretions that don't have bones in them too. So there's something about um, we do. I will say that like when there is bone, you do tend to get more concretion. So there's something about that, but I don't know quite what it is yet. We're sort of at this initial discovery stage. Um, but I, I have a few people who are sort of geochemists who are interested in those aspects. No, it's almost like, you know, it's a possibility perhaps the, the dinosaur bones almost acting like a seat for the chemical reactions to, to grow into a concretion. I mean, that's possible, but as you say, there's also associations with that's not the not the where, where I collect in the where I used to collect in the Isle of Wight, um, we'd sometimes get dinosaur bones. And you know the bones themselves have an anion surface and they attract um, iron um, from the surrounding sediment. So you get a little blue halo around the bone, which was iron poor. And the iron is leached into the bone itself. So you know there's not that much work. I mean been done on diagenesis compared to um, compared to looking at the actual sort of morphology of the bones and things like that. Um, but we, we have an expert on that down in South Dakota School of Mines. Um, she's a former former uh, volunteer on one of our digs. Now she's a professor down there, and she works on that. She works on how bone interacts with the sediment, and sometimes she works a lot on gut flora. So it can be the bacteria in the gut that mediate the um, mineralization of, of, of the sediment and sometimes some soft tissue preservation and things like that too. So yeah, there's a, a, mostly questions still exist on that kind of thing, um, but it is something that we definitely look at and think about. Um, I also noticed that the 
I think it's always been it's been great for tutors. So there hasn't been a lot of the deformation of the fossil remains. I mean, not any like was there any mass. It doesn't seem to be any massive um, compression uh, to to the fossils. Is that is that correct, or you know, is that just a, a, a luck of um, the actual bone material and the sediment it just happens to be in, and possibly the the calcite cement. Um. Yeah, there, there are. It's, it's easy to be lazy out in the Hell Creek and Judith because nice flat bedding, so you don't have to worry too much about that, and um, quite soft rocks relative to you know some of the really hard sandstones and everything that I'm used to back in the UK. Um, but there's a little bit of compression, and it's perhaps subtle enough that many people think that there isn't any. Mm -hmm. So um, things like classic I say is triceratops. If you find a triceratops preserved on a dorsoventrally like this, it's often a little bit compressed, so it has a really wide frill. But if it's preserved on its side, it gets compressed down and the frill looks very narrow. And a disarticulated skull will be preserved in lots of flat pieces, whereas an articulated skull could be one or the other. And the compression is subtle. So it's quite easy when you've got a very flat fossil to, um, recognize that it's been compressed, but it's not as obvious to people when it's not that compressed. But for the most part, there isn't much deformation like that, um, especially in the sandstones where they get support. Um, that first one, the nodosaur, the ankylosaur, it's a bit squashed. Like you should see this, the, the sacrum is flat. Like it's supposed to be, we thought it was a limb bone when we found it because it's just this long bone that the details are all kind of gone because it's been crushed flat but it was in a coal and there wasn't very much support for the um, for the bone there. In the sandstone, there's obviously a lot more grain grain contact. Uh, a question has been asked, the, uh, somebody was particularly impressed by the diagrams. Um, who produced them? Um, we have a team. Various people. Um, we have, so I, I commission artists from all over the world to draw some of the paintings and things like that. And we're a museum, you know, so anytime we get a picture done for a specimen, we have it in the exhibit, we sell postcards in the shop, all that kind of thing. So um, I'm very lucky that, that, that my admin supports that kind of thing. Um, skeletal diagrams, there's a few there from Scott Hartman, but I think some of them also from um, Danny Barrera, who's a Mexican paleontologist who's now up doing uh, her studies here. I produce quite a lot of the diagrams too. Um, yeah, it um, depends on which ones, but um, I, I did I did a bit of graphics work when I was in high school, so I'm more sort of font work and stuff like that, but I, I do do some drawing. But um, yeah, I, I love commissioning artwork from all these talented artists. Um, it's really, it's really pleasing. Like the three, I do all the 3D printing and I do some of the, um, a little bit of three adjustment of 3D models and things like that as well. But we got it. We got a team of people. I mean, it must be quite um, satisfying uh, to go through that process of literally putting some meat on the bones. You know, to make it into a a more recognisable thing for more general public uh, consumption. That you know makes it easier for for them to visualise it because it's a lot of time and effort and care has gone into trying to recreate that animal as well as you can. Uh, the best possible representation of probably what it looked like in life. Yeah, I mean, it's really good for communication with the public. I, I always used to say, like, I, I, I'd see in my mind's eye, like, what this thing looked like. Like, I, I collect, when I was on the Isle of Wight and I was collecting down there, the dinosaur bones, like, I'd find a little bit of an iguanodon on the beach and you can imagine it being part of a vertebral series and then what the face would look like. And But it, obviously, getting that across to the public is um, is paramount and the, the illustrations really help with that. Uh, so, you know, we try to make them colourful and attractive and, and useful for a number of different purposes. It certainly helps when you're doing publicity. And uh, I, when I was growing up, I always thought like, wouldn't it be great to hear about dinosaur news and fossil news? Like you occasionally get a little bit on the news, but now the internet's out there and you can find out about everything all the time. And I really want to get um, 
there's, there should always be like cool science fossil paleontology news out there for people who want to to read about it especially kids who are getting into science you know it's how they get into science so the more we can make it accessible to the media have some nice pictures so that more websites news websites uh, put it out there um, the better so we, we do consciously try and take photographs of cool the specimens and um, one of the things that I'm trying to do here is um, at this museum is not just show the very last step like when the paper comes out, you, you do the publicity. Uh, um, I want to show the first steps. Where, do, where does an idea come from? When you're testing a scientific idea or when we find something in the field, you know, what does it look like when you first find it? So it's one of the reasons why I do these uh, fieldwork presentations is to show every step of the process. Like, because cleaning stuff in, up in the lab, the lab's right behind me. That's really cool too like seeing it emerge like it's kind of boring when it's when it's already finished and clean and you see all the details that's half the story that's gone and so um as a small museum we can also benefit from telling the same story multiple times like here's the specimen when we found it here it is being cleaned up what are we hoping to find out and then what did we find out um you can kind of uh, double dip on the on the story that way um so I, I think that that's all part of the, the scientific communication that we are trying to do regarding these things is every step of the process. No, yeah, that's uh, fantastic. And uh, obviously, with the, I mean, you get to that, um, that slide where the, the, the Belgian artist had been involved. I mean, that was incredible uh, reconstruction. Um, I think you said it was a 3D um, print or something or? Uh, um, which which three? Talk. Which which model is that? Uh, the slide you you refer to, I think, um, and the little the skin was on the bone, but the the slide itself looked like a three D uh, representation, and I think you said that there'd been some input from a Belgian sculptor. Oh right, right. Yeah, so there's a there's a lad in Belgium who. Um, he, he was 3D sculpting um, things and selling and selling the 3D models. And um, I was actually trying to probably tilt my camera slightly. You might be able to see. There, there's a Leptoceratops. And that's another one he's made. And um, I didn't talk about our Hell Creek work today, but we've also collected some burrowing dinosaurs from, um, from the Hell Creek Formation. And um, you can't get a Leptoceratops anywhere. There are no casts available, anything. So I was like, well, okay, we're gonna have a 3D model made. So I got a few quotes and I knew that I knew this, I knew of this guy in Belgium because I'd seen some of his work and said, hey, could you make me a Leptoceratops? And he said, yeah, I'll do it. And so the great thing is I can print out six of those. I can print out 10 of them. I can have a whole flock, you know, doing whatever I like. I'm not just buying one cast from a company. And so um, I've been working with him a little bit on this one. And then, um, and then I, I wanted this Tyrannosaur reconstructed. So Amanda uh, next door um, in, in our collections, she took the 3D scanner and scanned all those bones. And I sent those files to Justin in Belgium and he's compiled them and he sculpted the brain case because we were missing those parts and uh, basically reconstructed the skull. Now, of course you, Often traditionally, you would um, maybe you'd get a copy of the brain case from another specimen, maybe at another museum. But again, as a small museum, we're always you know trying to find funding, and one of the ways we can get funding is by selling three D um, models of the things that we find or selling things in the shop. So if we completely own all the different parts of it, then we don't have to worry about infringing copyrights and things like that. So. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're getting those those parts sculpted, um, but they're very very accurate. And there's not very many parts that are missing either. So um, again, another, another aspect is the setting up these new revenue streams and selling copies in the gift shop. And you know, who makes stuff like these fridge magnets? People, people like having a souvenir, and it's it's cool stuff. You know, it's unique things that are unique to our museum. So. Um, if I, if I go with Justin's work making these 3D models, 
we don't just get a really cool reconstruction out of it. We get stuff that we can put in our shop that people can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps fund, fund the program here. Okay. I'll just make sure that we put some reference to your shop. It's not much running right now. We're hopefully going to have an online shop at some point soon. Most of it, I, when I say the shop, I mean the shop. At the uh, right. Physical shop, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's have a look. I think, that's, I think I've run through all the questions. Um, there's obviously a, a few hardy individuals have, have stayed on here. Oh, got a new message. Let's have a look, see what it says. Um, also, another thanks for the for the presentation. Um, I mean, I feel like the last half hour it's been you and I like a podcast here, but hopefully it's uh, it, it's been of some uh, use to the to the audience. So, I think in the absence of anything else, I think you have done extremely well, Denver. And Thank you. It's been an absolutely fascinating talk. I mean, you clearly see stuff out there that probably virtually everybody in this audience would die to see. I mean, we just don't see that over here. We, don't, we hear about the odd dinosaur find up in up in sky, but the stuff you get, I mean, it's it's almost like the cliche, go to, go to the States and everything bigger and better. It, it is a bit. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I lived most of my life in England. In the last 10, uh, 20 years I've been in um, America, I guess. But uh, it, it, it is it has been quite a, Quite a dream, so, but the stuff coming from Sky is super important and super cool, and, uh, and that's really exciting to see all that stuff coming out. Now I was up there in uh, God, probably 1998, maybe, and they were like, "Oh yeah, there's all these these uh, these uh, terrestrial rocks here that are from dinosaur ages." Like, was anyone looking in them? And uh, there's all sorts of cool stuff coming out now. It's really good. Yeah, I think we did, we did a presentation a couple of years ago, and it was. Um... I think it was a dinosaur footprints and trackways. And it was almost like they had just been overlooked for decades. You know, it was literally, it was almost a case like you needed to step back and then suddenly you, you, you could see the wood for the trees. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, people have been walking over these things for years and never, never noticed them. So they're the ones in Scotland again, right? Yeah. They're in, yeah. They're the, they're related to the, the Newark Supergroup stuff up in uh, the Northeast United States. Because I can't remember. I think the Sky stuff is a slightly different unit. I can't remember. But, um, but the, some the, the pterosaurs, like, it's not just odd bones that are coming out. It's like really top grade stuff. I know there's not loads of it, but it's mm -hmm. super cool, super important. Okay. Right. Um, well, I think you've earned a break, Denver. So, I was drying out part way through, I think. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've done very well. You've done incredibly well. I mean, that's an hour and a half. That's 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 excellent. And apologies for the, the stuttering start, because my Zoom actually crashed. <laughs> oh. Chatting about, oh, no, don't tell me I've lost the meeting, because I've, I've, you know, I'm hosting it. I think possibly because you were co-hosting it, uh, it prevented it falling apart completely. So, for the limited amount of people that are left, I would just like to... Thank you very much on behalf of the Society for giving off your time uh, for our night. Um, been really, really enjoy, enjoyable. The people who didn't manage to stay much longer, you know, really interesting, fascinating, absolutely fascinating, a truly excellent presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Fascinating story. Thanks for a fa fascinating talk. A great presentation again. So, on behalf of the Society, thank you very much, uh, Denver, and hopefully we might get the pleasure of your company sometime in the future for some more of your super finds. Absolutely. It's been great. It's always, it's always great to speak back home, you know. It's like uh, it's, uh, I've been away for a while, and it's always nice to, to hear from people back there. And, yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's been really great. You've been more than welcome, and thank you very much. Okay. Have a good night now. Bye now. Right.